I'd like to welcome you to this uh, Tipsy Math um, activity event. Uh, for those who don't know, Tipsy Math is an organization that works on um, helping post-secondary education in mathematics. And we have a website and we have lots of activities going on. Probably the, the some of the main, main activities that we do throughout the year um, is we do leadership training for math and stats uh, faculty and um, people in the math and stats community. So if you're interested in that, you can check out our website. We do have um, our next cohort of um, Leadership Institute people. The application deadline is tomorrow, which might be too quick for a lot of you, but think about that um, as an option. Another thing that Tipsy does a lot uh, relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, the, the Leadership Institute this coming year will be focusing on that. And at the MAA Math Fest in August, which is in Tampa, we'll be doing a couple sessions there. We'll be doing a workshop training uh, for people who int are interested in being maybe a DEI consultant. And we'll also have a session, a paper session, invited paper session, where people can talk about DEI efforts that they've done in their own departments and programs. And um, uh, another activity we do is a department chair's work uh, webinar. Now, you don't have to be a department chair, but this started out for um, department chairs. We've had uh, two recently, one last semester, I believe it was, that we talked about the impact the pandemic had on student and what faculty can do to help students after the pandemic. And we had one recently this semester that was on non-academic careers uh, for students. So those are some of the things that, that Tipsy is doing. Um, today, we've got this uh, webinar here that is sponsored by one of the MAGs, which is a group an advisory group in Tipsy. This one is by the Lower Division Pathways, and I'm going to turn the time over to Britt to do to introduce the session. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, and welcome to all of you who've joined uh, uh, this uh, webinar. Um, I'm Britt Kerwin, uh, a mathematician, uh, former university president, and um, Chancellor Emeritus of the University of Maryland system. I'm on the board of Tipsy. And um, we have, uh, I think, a really interesting uh, webinar today on the issue of student support and success in the hybrid era. I've been reading, we've all been reading a lot about um, how students are feeling pressure for, uh, in lots of ways, and the issue of providing better support, both counseling and academic support, is really front and center for our colleges and universities. We have. Uh, a, a very excellent panel, uh, Heather Robbins, who's a distinguished university lecturer at the University of Toledo, Sandra Robinson, associate lec lecturer also at the University of Toledo, um, Nicholas Shea, who's an assistant professor at Columbus State Community College, my old stomping ground in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, Patrick Lee, who's the interim vice president of academic success and associate professor at Palo Alto College. So our plan today is um, we're going to have these four experts uh, take about five minutes to um, say a little bit about what they are doing in this uh, general area of support and success in the hybrid area era. And we're going to hold them to five minutes. They've uh, worked hard to keep their comments down to that. And then we're going to have uh, four breakout panels that they will lead. So it'll be an opportunity uh, to interact with them and um, have further discussion on uh, uh, the topic that they introduce. So um, we're ready to start with that. And we'll just go in the order that I mentioned, first Heather, then Sandra, then Nicholas, and then Patrick. So Heather, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brett. I greatly appreciate being here. I. I think I better first preface that um, I am not a mathematician. I come to you via um, STEM, but in the biology realm, and I primarily teach anatomy, physiology, microbiology, pathophysiology. So I really do appreciate you allowing me to um, 
venture into your world. Um, my topic is belonging. Um, if you're not familiar, although I do think it is becoming a pretty strong um, academic term where we're even tapping it into the DEIB, so diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, it's just a feeling of being valued and connected to one's community. Um, this could be in sense of, um, if you want to maybe go to the next slide, I'm going to try to do my, my quick bit of five minutes here. I'm not sure who's running it. Um, what research has shown is that um, if we don't address the student's sense of belonging, it really has a strong adverse effect on, on college. And it can even start before classes. Um, the first day, if students already feel like they don't belong, um, they have difficulty making friends within the first few months and then midterms hit, they get a really low exam grade and really start to question whether they should be here or not be here. And I think what research is really showing is it's really scary for um, first gen students or underrepresented minorities because there is um, there's a little bit of a cost of trying to kind of move up in, in their ladder. Um, and if they're already struggling with trying to better themselves and explaining that to um, their peers or their family members, it becomes even more difficult to believe it in themselves. So we see as this, in, you know, unfortunately, this exponential decrease in confidence in their belonging. So if you want to kind of flip to the next one. And, you know, Lisa Nunn has done a ton of research on this, and she basically says there's kind of three realms of belonging. Um, there's the social belonging, there's the campus community and the resources, but academically, I feel like um, it is our due diligence as faculty because we are the ones that get a chance to interact with them. Every student at the university is going to have to have a faculty member. That's the one thing they have in common. So what can we do to allow students to feel like they can engage with us and have a sense of belonging within this community. So if you wanna go ahead and flip to the next for me. Um, I'll talk more about this in our breakout sessions. Um, and I'm assuming that these are, well, it's being recorded so you can see the slide, but it's also, I think, gonna be shared with you. Um, these are just little things instructors can do. And, and I think that's the most important message I wanna to send to you folks is that we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. Um, there's just small little lifts that we can do in our classes to make students feel like they belong. Probably the biggest thing is the initial message to students via the syllabus. Um, think about the student's lens, put that lens on if you will, and writing that, are you, are you more diverse in your language? Are you providing examples? Are you showing them sources? Are you messaging different things about textbook? Um, are there other affordable ways for a textbook for students? Um, make sure you understand attendance. It's not about um, kind of reducing our academic rigor or standards of our course. It's just, again, being mindful of what we're trying to do and who we're trying to communicate. Um, if you wanna to flip to the next one, um, I'm sure most of you are extremely familiar with, and I, I'm going to probably butcher his name, so if anybody wants to correct me, I will not be offended. I think it's Uri Treisman. If I get that correct, I'm not positive, but um, yeah. good. And this one came from, I can't take credit from this, this is from Bryce Bunting at a conference I attended in a workshop, but um, I've vamped it for mine, but I figured since you guys are math people, I would keep his model accurate and up to date. And so what he basically is saying is there's a bunch of ways we can create a classroom where students feel included and they feel like um, they have an established identity. So he kind of starts off and he shows this, that you're embarking on this journey and he uses class to orient students to math, to calculus even at the University of, of Learning and Teaching. Um, and right away, he establishes belonging. So in his example, he was saying, you know, you're a phoenix. I always talk about, you're a rocket now. You know, we're all in this together. Um, he says, he starts addressing his students as mathematicians. You know, you're our future leaders. You are one of us. And then what really quickly he does is he normalizes challenges. And he's like, you know, here's the deal. I'm your teacher for life. You've got me for a lifetime deal. Um, I'm gonna be here for you whenever you need it. And so what's neat about it is then he right away just says calculus is in your blood. And he says, you know, it starts with me. So I'm your direct link to calculus, but it does come from, you know, Yuri Treisman. 
and then Treisman's PhD advisor, um, and then the you know his great grandfather Alonzo Church, and he goes into even the ninth, tenth, and eleventh generation of how he traces it clear back to Newton and how calculus was invented. And so it, you know, I just kind of want to say if you start acting to students or modeling to students that you know you can do this, they start believing in that. Um, and if you want to kind of flip through the next slide for me. We're going to we're going to need to move to the next uh, presenter soon. So cool. Yeah, yeah. And I just wanted to show these are other examples. So you can show belonging through representation. It doesn't always have to be the white male perspective where most of the textbooks are originally. You can introduce these into that little by little. And the last thing is I've kind of created an exercise that again you'll have attachments to that helps students kind of normalize challenges so they don't feel like they're alone. And again, it, it helps bring up their sense of belonging. It shows that you have a fixed mind or a growth mindset that you believe in students. So um, if you want to just flip to my contact slide, this is, you know, you can go ahead and ask me any details you want. I'm here to help and thank you for having me. Heather, thank you very much. Uh, I think we're going to switch the order a little bit because the slides have been loaded. So. I'm not sure who's next, but uh, hopefully you the, the next person knows. Is it you, Nick? Yep, so um, thank you all. And um, Heather, I think Robin might have had a question for you in the chat. So um, if you wanna. Um, yeah, so, go ahead, Robin, ask a question and I'll, I'll get yeah. to it. Um, so what I'm here to talk about today is, um, I teach both in person and online and hybrid courses. And one of the things I've noticed is, especially post COVID, um, some of the more student centered skills uh, that I kind of assume students came in with have kind of fallen by the wayside. I teach a co requisite math class. So I'm dealing with students who are right on that line between developmental mathematics and uh, placing into that college level course. So one of the things that I've tried to do is I've tried to be intentional about teaching some of these student success skills. And one of the ones I quickly realized, especially in my online classes, is just being a little more intentional about note-taking and note-taking strategies. So uh, it is a skill set. And one of the things I wanna say is, I know we're very used to teaching subject matter, but if students lack the skills to be able to truly grasp the concepts we're trying to teach them, we're not really going to be accurately measuring their retention or really how well we're doing at our job of conveying these, these ideas. So as much as, you know, I have a lot of uh, colleagues that kind of scoff at this idea, it's necessary because if we're going to be measuring how well we're conveying these ideas, um, we need to make sure they have those foundational skills and we kind of owe it to ourselves to provide some of this structure for students. Now, if a student is in calculus three differential equations, they might have those skills already, but at the level that I typically teach at, I have to address those skills as well. So I'm gonna show a couple examples of how I do that. Um, obviously in the limited amount of time, uh, I can't really go too deeply into these. So I'm just gonna kind of briefly go over them and uh, just kind of talk about them. So the main one that most people are used to is some sort of guided notes. If you're gonna be giving a graphical representation or some sort of word story problem, word problem, providing these copies that have these fill in the blanks is necessary. Again, I think most of you are familiar with this. The one thing I'll touch on regarding these is um, a lot of students will say, hey, are you going to post completed versions of these? And one of the strategies that I've taken to is I have a conditional assignment in my learning management system where they have to actually submit a completed copy of these notes to me before they gain access to the completed version. Because again, if they're just copying and writing down what's filled on the page, it's passive. They're not really gaining the skills that we want them to have. So that's just one thing that if you do use guided notes and you're just posting completed versions, it's something to maybe consider to implement in your course just to get students engaged with that. Um, a lot of students are, or a lot of faculty are aware of the Cornell note taking process. Um, again, if I teach with this method, I would provide a structure of this. And then as the weeks go on, I slowly pull these scaffolds away. So there might be a lot on what this page looks like to begin with. And then as we move throughout weeks, you'll start to see it becomes more sparse to the point that I might just give them in by week like seven or eight when I've used these 
then it's just the lines and they are creating the questions on the left side, the right hand side has some more detailed notes, and then we provide them a summary on the bottom. One thing I like to use Cornell and taking for is when I'm focusing on a very specific theme, like how do we find that top of the hill of a quadratic function? That's kind of the question at the top, and then we work our way through it, and then we summarize at the bottom. So presenting it as kind of a problem-based approach is a good way to address Cornell note-taking skills. I really like this four diamonds in a square method because I have a lot of nonlinear thinking thinkers. I teach a quantitative reasoning, like a uh, liberal arts math, some people think of it as, and I just have a lot of nonlinear thinkers in those courses. So presenting the problem in the center and then allowing the students to choose how they're going to work around. So um, this is just a basic, which is better to use a $5 off or a 20% off coupon, does order matter? Some students will jump down to the lower left and just start solving it. Some students, I, I encourage, it's designed to be in a counterclockwise, kind of how the quadrants are labeled, but it, they can go in any order they want. So that really provides them that flexibility. Um, this last one is a mind map. I use this, here's an example of graphing rational functions. Anything that has a lot of procedures to it, I like to use this. Normally what would happen is it's just the graphing rational functions in the middle. That's all that they see on the page. They have to make these bubbles on the outside of kind of the subtopics of what they need to find to get to these different portions. And then from there, they're going to have some more specific details about each aspect within that process. This is really nice for those larger procedures, related rates, graphing rational functions, things like that, where you have a lot of steps to that. And just the last thing I would say about these note-taking skills is um, share the research with your students. One thing we've learned about uh, younger students, they need the why. Now, they may not read the whole paper, but if you show them a research paper and say, hey, look, scientifically, we have proven that note-taking is better, um, scaffolding the process, People don't want to do this or want to hear this, but you have to incentivize it. I require it in my online course. I have them scan their notes and upload them. It's worth 3% of their overall grade. It's easy. I don't grade it. I grade it based on completion. But if a student doesn't do well on an assessment, it allows me to go back and have a data point to address with them. So I'll actually pull those notes up and say, hey, you didn't do so well on the test. Let's look at how well you're doing at taking notes. And that's a really helpful thing for us. So there's some other things in here to try to incentivize it, but students don't do optional. So you can try to present all these concepts if you want, but unless you incentivize it in some way, they're not going to do it. So I would encourage you to reflect on kind of how you would motivate the students to do that or incentivize it if you are going to incorporate this. That was really fast, and I understand that, but um, if anybody has any questions, um, I'm happy to address those. Thank you guys so much. Nick, great presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, who's next? Sandra. Hi, Hi thank you. Uh, my name is Sandra Robinson. I'm from uh, University of Toledo, and thank you for inviting us here. Today, I wanted to address an idea of assessment wrappers and wise feedback. So first, let's just talk about what an assessment wrapper is. It's really you're guiding your students through an assessment. You try to get them to start thinking about how they're going to prepare for the assessment. You talk about maybe what's on the assessment and then you wrap it up after the assessment has been graded and talk about what they can do um, better or what they should kind of think about um, what they did beforehand and the grade that they got for their assessment. And so this really pairs well with some wise feedback. Um, <clears throat> and because when you're communicating with your students, you really want to support them and encourage growth. We give our, we spend a lot of time grading and we give our students this feedback, but we wanna make sure that the feedback that we're giving is wise. We're letting our students know that we believe in them, we have high expectations, and these are the reasons why we're giving them the feedback and that they can grow um, from and learn from the feedback that we're giving. So if a student does not do well on an assessment, we try to guide them back to how they prepared, what they did. Um, the wise feedback will help them look at specific topics and what they need to improve on and then discuss ways on what they can do to 
um, become better for the next one. <clears throat> so talking about that wise feedback, there's really four elements that you want to consider when you're giving wise feedback. You want it to be an honest description of the performance. We're not we're not saying, you know, this feedback should be sugarcoating something. If it's clear the student is not understanding a fundamental concept in your class, you want to make sure that that um, is clear to your students. You, um, you want to, you know, make sure that your high standards are being communicated with your students. And that's the reason why we're giving the feedback. We're not giving feedback to make them feel um, that they're unintelligent. We're giving them feedback because we want them to grow in their ability. Um, students often need some assurance. So you want to, again, relay to them that you're giving this feedback because you believe that they can achieve their high standards and then give them specific suggestions for improvement, things that they can do immediately, actionable feedback that they can use right away to improve on the next assessment. <clears throat> um, one of the things that I like to think about in terms of the assessment wrapper is kind of like a three layer sandwich. You've got to do the before the first assessment. I try to start this at least one week before my first assessment. I check in with my students. I'm constantly reminding them that, hey, there's this test coming up. What are you going to do? How do you plan to study? And I even send out an email with a checklist of things that they could be doing and things that have high impact in terms of studying. I try to be very transparent with what is on my exam. For instance, if I'm giving you know, an exam that includes definition of the derivative, I'm going to say, hey, you know, definition of the derivative is definitely on this exam. Um, students tend to uh, forget that uh, you know you have to add common denominators so don't forget that so you're giving them specific examples and you're being very transparent with what is on your exam and the expectations that you have then the middle layer is that wise feedback oftentimes uh, instructors are like oh, I don't have time for that wise feedback which I totally appreciate I write a solution key but I, I write detailed answers I put down specific sections and modules of where these problems came from. And if they got it wrong, they should go back and, and look at that section, maybe go back to the notes, do some homework problems. And then before that second assessment, I bring them back to those set of questions that I had asked them about how they will plan to reflect and prepare for their test and see where they might want to improve on if things did not go as well as they had planned for the first assessment. So in terms of timing, I'm gonna wrap it up there, but I do have examples that I am happy to share um, and you can always reach out to me as well. And I can explain in more detail, we can talk about it in the breakout uh, group on specific examples of my assessment wrappers and why feedback. Thank you, Sandra. Excellent. Um, and now we're ready for our final presentation. All right, thank you. So I didn't get mine in presentation in time to include in the groups, but I have it here. Let me pull it up. Make sure everybody can see this. And let me do this. All right. Um, so good morning or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you're at. Uh, my name is Patrick Lee. I am the Interim Vice President for Academic Success uh, here at Palo Alto College in San Antonio, Texas. We're one of five colleges in the Alamo Colleges system. Um, I've been here at Palo Alto for about 21 years now. I started here at Palo Alto as a mathematics faculty and then uh, chair of the mathematics department. Um, I've been the dean for career and technical education uh, my primary role is Dean for Academics, All Academics now, and I'm currently serving as Interim Vice President. One of the things I wanted to do, and it, it's probably appropriate that I go last of the group because mine is more of an overarching presentation about what we do in terms of strategies for enhancing student support services in our math courses, and in particular, 
in our entry level math courses for students. One of the first thing I wanted to do is give everybody a quick background of, of who we are. Uh, this is a PAC student profile, right? We're a predominantly Hispanic serving institution. Uh, we have uh, the majority of our students are part time, although they do swirl, as we say, across our five colleges within our system. Uh, we do serve a, a high number of uh, early college and dual credit students, so dual enrolled students. And we do serve a community that is a very underserved community and that typically has a very uh, low percentage of college going rate. Traditional headcount for our institution, we serve about 11,000 students a semester. I'm going to go through these very quickly. And um, one of the primary things, or two of the primary things we're always looking about, particularly in terms of success for math students, because we know it's so critical that they are successful early in their careers because we encourage them all to take the math course during their first semester. And it it's, can be a lot of pressure, of course, on math faculty, but that math course, is, as many of you know, or all of you know, can be a critical component in their entire education and could be a, a make or break thing as to whether or not they pursue or continue with higher education. So we focus on persistence, whether students stay. We took a dip during the pandemic, as everyone did, and have rebounded. But our primary goal is, of course, students completing, you know, ensuring that they have the support that they need in their math courses, and of course, also in English and other courses, uh, to be successful and graduate. And we've been fairly successful here at Palo Alto. We do, um, we're fortunate to have a very high graduation rate. And a lot of that um, has to do with what the strategies that we've put in place and our math faculty have put in place to ensure that students are successful in their math courses, particularly early. So some of our goals that we look at um, through implementing some enhanced student support services. We're trying to provide students, again, with this holistic wraparound services, both through our student support and through academic support, as I'll talk about, and I'll just briefly talk about it here, and then we can get more into it in the breakout session. But some of the things we always look at, we're trying to address student preparedness, right? So before we can provide them the support in class, we want to make sure that they're prepared to enter our courses and that they're also appropriately placed. It's things that we found over the years that often students aren't, don't end up in the right math course for whatever their pathway is. So we have a lot of strategies in place through our academic uh, support services and also through our student support services and our advising to ensure that students are placed correctly, either through a summer refresher course uh, to help them prepare and also that they're in the right course for the pathway because we have several options. We have STEM, non-STEM, liberal arts, business. Um, we have a couple others that are more specific for our technical programs. We need to make sure they're in the right place. And we need to accelerate student completion. You know, for years we had, four, I hate to admit it, and it's a shame to admit it, four levels of developmental mathematics. Um, and we would have students that would spend two years going through developmental. And I think, as Nick mentioned, the COREC, we've switched in the state of Texas and in Alamo Colleges in Palo Alto to an entirely COREC model where students go in and we've formulated the support system in such a way that what we've ended up with is students that are actually end up being more successful in COREC than they were in our developmental system. And then, of course, in class, we want to provide students with the necessary academic supports that help them be successful. Of course, like any university and college, we're limited in budget. So we try and do things within the budget that we have and provide support services uh, that are both impactful, but are also to scale across all of our co uh, courses. And last on the list, but not last overall, is we build connections, right? It's so critical. I think Heather mentioned this at the beginning, it's so critical that they feel connected to the college, that they're not just coming, taking class and going home. So in all of our math courses, we try and build that connection. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a second. Again, student placement. I'll go through this quickly. Um, we, we've worked over the years in enhancing our summer programs. We have what we call refresher courses for students that, that can come in for two weeks or up to four weeks and take courses with our instructors learn skills that they may have forgotten 
or prepare for specific courses. We have refresher courses specifically in non-STEM and STEM math courses that will prepare them for that upcoming semester because many students haven't been in school for a while or maybe they haven't taken a course even in high school in math for over a year or two years. We design our new student orientation specifically to streamline enrollment in our co-requisite developmental and entry-level math courses. And then we have an advising model where we've shifted to where we have specific co-requisite math, we do it for English as well, advisors that focus specifically on that population of students that we find often to be the most at risk of not continuing. Patrick, uh, we do want to move to the breakouts, so if you could wrap up pretty Perfect quickly. Perfect timing. Yeah, so these are the strategies, and I'll talk about these in the breakout that we look at when we do academic support. Embedded tutoring, we do learning communities between our math courses and our introductory orientation learning frameworks courses. We have early alert programs throughout the semester to ensure that students are getting the tutoring support that they need. We look at e-portfolios for reflective learning. That's something we've introduced in the math courses. And again, we have advisors that are fully, we try to fully integrate into our math courses. So they're working directly with the students to build those connections and build connections with students, and then students building connections with their instructor and with the college overall. And that's Great. it, sorry. Thank you so much. So uh, we're now gonna have about 20 minutes in a breakout sessions with our four leaders. And Cassie, I think you're gonna manage that for us. Yes, give me just a minute to make these breakout rooms and they're self-selected so you can join whichever room that you would like. Well, um, I hope uh, everybody had as a rich and engaging session as, uh, as we did. It was uh, just, uh, just excellent. I want to, again, uh, thank our uh, presenters for really teeing up this uh, discussion today. Um, uh, and as I said at the very outset, uh, this whole issue of uh, providing better support of all types to our students is so paramount. I mean, it's uh, we've all read the, the challenges this uh, generation of students is experiencing and uh, the kinds of things we've heard about today are, um, uh, send such a positive message uh, to to students that uh, how much uh, uh, they are the focus of our attention and how much uh, we do care about uh, them and their learning. Um, Cassie, uh, just real quickly, how can people access the uh, materials for today? Um, we can share the slideshow on our website as well as um a condensed video of the five minute presentations today. So that should be up on the website sometime next week. Great. And, uh, uh, and, and there, there was a recording. Is, uh, is it possible for people to access the recording? Yes, I'll put that up as well. Um, I just dropped a link in the chat and that's where you should be able to find the recording and the slides. Okay, great. Once the video is edited. Yeah. So Michael, any final word? Nope. Nope. I think that was great. Yeah. Terrific. Well, thank you again. Thank our presenters and all of you for participating and uh, keep on the lookout for other uh, tipsy webinars and programs. And we uh, hope to welcome you back uh, in the not too distant future. Have a great day, everyone.